Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Berkelhammer. Well, today, this is a real pleasure. I've got Jason Fox from Jason Fox Signature Corals on the show. What's up there, Jason? How you doing, man? Good, how you pretty doing? good, pretty good. A little, a uh, little chilly here in Vermont. I guess it's uh, not as cold down in uh, Maryland is where you're at, right? Yep, Maryland. Yeah. Not quite as cold as Vermont, I'm sure. Still a little chilly. Yeah, we're yeah. looking at uh, probably minus forty to minus fifty wind chill tomorrow and Saturday. So uh, could be deadly for uh, for me. <laughs> I'm gonna try to do a little skiing, but uh, maybe one run and I'm done. Yeah, it's a little cold. So, uh, all right, I'm psyched to uh, to uh, to talk to you, Jason. We got a lot of people that are uh, are coming in the stream, and I see a whole bunch of folks in the chat as well. So, uh, before we start chatting with Jason, I want to thank the sponsors for this show, both Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. I really appreciate these companies supporting the show, and I appreciate the support from all you folks out there tuning in. Please spread the word, hit that like button, so more people can find the uh, live stream. And uh, as always, I always encourage you folks to uh, ask a lot of questions and uh, post your comments in the chat. I'll do my best to, uh, to keep track of all that stuff. And there's a lot of you folks in the chat right now, which is really cool. So, um, yeah, I've got, uh, I got a bunch of questions for, uh, for Jason, but um, we will do our best to, uh, to weave in some stuff from, uh, from the uh, viewing audience. So, so, Jason, man, how long have you been um, in the reef keeping hobby? When did it all start for you? How many years ago? In the 90s. In the 90s. In the 90s. I got pretty serious in uh, early 2000s is when I really started to get serious about it. Um, I had freshwater and, like, clownfish and stuff like that probably in the, in the uh, 80s. Right. You know, ever since I can remember, I had aquariums. Um Old under, you know, remember those undergravel yeah, filters? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you started it with, a, huh? Like an undergravel filter? That's, that's how I started back in the day. I'm I'm 50 now, and, uh, you know, my mom always said the first word I ever said was ish for fish. When I pointed at <laughs> a fish and I had goldfish bowls, she said, ever since. 
ever. You know, so. Same what my were your, uh, like anybody in the family, uh, you know, into it before uh, you got into it? Any, any, uh, anybody kind of like role model uh, for you in terms of um, reef keeping? No? No, not at all. Not at all. Back in the day, I didn't even have any friends in the hobby. Really? I used to look at, uh, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the, like Coletta's uh, <clears throat> Ultimate Aquariums book and different covers of the book and, oh, wow. I wish I could have that someday, you know what I'm saying? I had nobody in the hobby that I was friends with, nobody to uh, share notes with. I didn't have the internet or anything back then. No computer, you know, so. So how, how did uh, you um, how did you become so good at it, man? I mean, uh, you just kind of like learn by doing. You made mistakes and learned along the way or, or um, just. That's yeah. it. Yeah, you know, learn along the way. Learn from your mistakes, deductive thinking. I was a mechanic by trade. Always I have been. I still work on my own stuff, and that helps a lot with the plumbing and, main, you know, making the systems work and making stuff work. Yep. Um, it's always helpful to have mechanical skills. Um, years ago, I had a couple uh, – I ended up getting a couple buddies up in Pennsylvania, and they came down and saw my tanks. <clears throat> and they couldn't believe it. And I didn't know what I had. I had no idea. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then uh, they, I went to a little uh, coral show not selling coral up in Pennsylvania. And Dr. Mack from Pacific East Aquaculture yeah. was there. And uh, those guys were like, you know, you ought to go see Jason's corals and his stuff down there. It's pretty amazing. And he came down. He saw it. Cause I was buying from him cause he's not far from me, from me in Maryland, two hours away and his jaw hit the floor and he couldn't believe it. And I started realizing that maybe, maybe you're, maybe you're right? on to something. <laughs> maybe I'm on to something right? <laughs> so, um, you know, back then, what was like your, I'm assuming that you've, um, have, have, have your methods evolved over the years or have you kind of like stuck with the way you've, uh, you started keeping reef tanks or, um, I mean, maybe we should start with how you, um, you know, what, what kind of methods you did, you know, back uh, when you first got into it, I'm assuming your metal halides were part of the equation. Oh yeah. Of yeah. course. Metal halides, you know, that was the main, I remember having a 75 gallon tank and I had an old, uh, 175 watt hydroform halide fixture. Wow. I was like, I wonder what they would do on that 75-gallon <laughs> tank. Stuck it up, playing around with it, and and I liked it. You know, I could finally keep uh, get some acros and stuff that yep. have color. You know, I mean, I remember the first acro frag that I saw in crusting, and I was so excited, like, oh my! It's God. working. <laughs> it's working. I have a world. It's living. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. And but uh, so what what did what did your uh, like first systems look like in terms of equipment what uh, what did you what were the basics you know I, I had obviously decent flow I had those uh, I had those I got into those HQI yeah I guess double ended them. HQI bulbs yeah that pop in and had a couple of those uh, T5s or the U-shaped T5s um, in with them skimmers you know, I don't even remember what skimmer I had way back then, you know, but uh, simple. Yep. Um, I mean, early back in the day, I used to just top off the sump with the water hose. <laughs> <You know laughs> yeah, <what> right. <laughs> no, I mean, I didn't even have any top off equipment or anything. Um, so I guess it's kind of the same deal as I do still. You know, I'm more bare bottom now. I had more sand in my tanks then. Um, my smaller tanks, I still like having sand in them for smaller tanks. I think it kind of helps keep them a little bit more stable Yep. Uh, for the bigger tanks. I can't really get the flow that I want to do everything with the sand and it makes it a lot more work having sand in there. Um, skimmers, you know, I went from like a, uh, what an old Dell tech skimmer to a uh, bubble King. Um, and now I'm using uh reef octopus. Yep. I've gotten away from halides, obviously. Yeah. So, what are your what are your thoughts in terms of why why did you get away from the halides? Was it just more about the heat, or um, just um, what what was the reason why you did the uh, transition from halides to LEDs? I stuck. I, I hung on to halides for a long time. 
And, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, wow, you still use halides. And I'm seeing different people's tanks doing good on just LEDs. So I started tinkering with them a little bit. Once I lost the halides and started with LEDs and T5s, then I, didn't, I, had, I could get rid of the chillers. Right, right. Which was a no, no chillers. Yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got two different systems. I've got one system with LEDs, no chiller. And then I got another system with halides and T5s, which um, has a chiller, but I've got a ton of fans on it. So um, that chiller, you know, I, I have all my stuff in my finished basement, so it stays pretty cool in the summertime. So rarely does that chiller kick on. So I, I could still yep. kind of like get away with, um, you know, running the halides without having to worry too much about the heat. Sure, you know? sure. Yeah, I guess my final decision on the halides was the bulbs were burning out. I was sick of replacing the bulbs. I had halides, T5s, and LEDs on my um, 700. And I ended up, I had halides down the center. The bulbs were burning out. And eventually it was like a couple bulbs still left on there. And it's like, well, I guess I'm not using halides anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I took the halides out and I put another... T5 and Reef Bright uh, LED strip down the middle of the tank, and nothing changed. You know, it was still the what same. What was your um, bulb of choice for halides? Oh, man. I don't even remember. Oh, really? Radiums. Ra uh, 20K radiums? Radiums. Yeah. I used that point. Yeah. I think that was the, the final bulb that I was using. Yeah. The 20K. There was a couple other ones before that. Um, I'm not sure. I don't even remember yeah. what they were. Yeah. No. Now it was kind of like recent for me in terms of um, finally getting away from. Uh, you know, I started the uh, my Peninsula tank a couple of years ago, and so it was tough for me to um, to not start that tank with halides and and kind of take that leap of faith with LEDs. But there's just a lot of kick-ass tanks out there and systems that uh, flourish right. under uh, under LEDs. Um, yeah. But um, you know, and I think. Did you ever uh, use like a hybrid approach in terms of LEDs and halides at at one point in time, or was it kind of like cut the cord with the halides and? No, I mean I had T fives and LEDs and halides at the same time on that okay. seven hundred. One to one to seven. It's still the same tank, but uh, so I was using all of it, and uh, that's why I just really didn't notice much difference when I stopped with the halides. So we're getting a bunch of questions in the uh, in the chat, and uh, a lot of these questions I uh, I was planning to ask you, but let's uh, let's start sprinkling a few in here randomly. Um, Doghouse Reefer, uh, what's your secret, Jason Fox? What's your main focus to achieve the amazing colors and growth? So why don't we just get right into it? <laughs> Water changes. Water changes. Yeah. Anytime any my tanks or something's not liking the way I like it, I hit it with big water changes. What salt are you using? The uh, Instant Ocean's Reef Crystals. Interesting. And 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 uh, so do you do water changes on a regular basis? I mean, is it like weekly at a certain percentage, or is it just whenever you're noticing something? No, there, I, I've got like a recipe. It's every week. Every other week I do water changes on the big systems. On something like a 32 BioCube or something, like this little one behind me, I'll do about 75% a week. Oh, wow. That's big. Yeah. I have a no skimmer. I don't test test any of the water parameters. Nothing. All I do is water changes. So on all systems, you don't test parameters. No, okay, just that uh, smaller system. I don't think that I do that much. Obviously, I know the salinity of the water I'm doing that big of a water change with. I'm just taking it out of my big 300 gallon mix tanks. Gotcha. Um, but the uh, other systems, I'm checking the parameters. Depends on what perimeter it is, daily to weekly to monthly, even depending on alkalinity is the one I'm at. I'm on. How often do you test on alkalinity and what are you using to test? Salifert, Salifert test kit. And I check it, you know, if it's hanging, I basically check alkalinity in four, four systems. <clears throat> and uh, if it's hanging, if, it's, if the alkalinity is hanging pretty stable at that moment, then I'll check it twice a week. But if it's not stable at that moment, I'll check it on a daily basis until it's stable until it's stable again. And being out of, you know, being not stable could be, 
the media and the calcium reactors low, turn the CO2 up. So you got a little more CO2 in there as the media goes low, turn the effluent coming out of it up a little yep. bit. Sometimes I'm using Calquasser in my top offs. I'll, I'll, I'll put Calquasser in the top offs or I'll put in Calquasser in and I can turn the reactors down a yep. little bit or down whatever. So they're not raising the alkalinity as much, you know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, that's basically, you got a feel for it too with your systems, you know, yep. uh, of your, obviously it's. <laughs> here's a funny question from our uh, moderator, Paul, great beard of reef. Here's the real question, uh, reef. Um, what's Jason Fox electric bill monthly? <laughs> you don't have to share that if you don't want to. <laughs> It's a lot, man. It's a lot. And it's going up. I mean, the electric bill's up towards $1,500 a month. Yeah, that's not bad. You know, it's not bad. No, be all not too shabby. So uh, let's get back to the uh, the alkalinity thing. Have you ever thought about getting an alkalinity monitor? I have, but I've never heard anything really great about them. It seems like it might be just easier just to check it with the test kits. The monitors, I hear you, you got to tinker with them and change the probes and stuff. Yep. You know, I, I'm not really a uh, real techie guy. I like to keep stuff as simple as possible. You know, if they come out with the alkalinity meter, the meter that's reliable, oh, sure, that would be awesome. Yeah. That would be my dream. Yeah. But it, I don't know of one. I mean, maybe they have one now, but I don't know of one. It, it's, it only takes a minute. To check the alkalinity with a sulfur kit you know it's <laughs> yeah no you're right man it's like uh that's kind of like a tried and true uh test kit i i used um i used to use the uh the sulfur alkalinity test kit for for many 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 years and um you know i'm still using i use the um <clears throat> the ghl um cage director to uh to measure alkalinity now and i do it like twice a day but i've also become you know um i'm not like um you know, just really going crazy over the numbers. I'm trying to like not overreact to like maybe possibly low number or high number. I used to really try to keep it dialed in like at eight and a half or between eight and a half and nine in terms of that DKH. Um, I don't have the, um, you know, the cage director controlling, you know, the calcium reactors on my systems and all that stuff. But uh, I think it's, um, you know, a lot of times you can overreact uh you know in terms of uh the alkalinity so i i try not to go too nuts with it you know i think i'm i'm happier now if it's in a range between like seven and a half and and uh and nine do you um do you have a certain range you like to keep it in i mean i like eight to nine i really like nine um even a little bit higher than nine i like um if i see it go down to six then i just adjust the flu i don't worry about it let it go up. If I see it go up to 10 or 11 or something, bring it back down, you know? And it doesn't have to, like, get it down right that second. That's the idea of checking it on a weekly or twice-a-week basis. This is, it's the guys that check it once a month, and their alkalinity is 12 or 13, and it's been like that for three weeks. <laughs> then, then, then you get problems. Right. Right. But I, I think like um, bouncing around between a, uh, a reasonable range is not that big of a deal. I think it's no, no big deal at yeah. all. I really. Yeah. Know, I mean, um, so I've seen this a couple of times in the chat. I don't know if this is a, is a, a, a miss uh, being, being mistyped or whatnot. New venture, old school. What does he think about Alc at 20 with everything thriving? I've never heard of an Alc at 20. I've never heard of it either, you know. I mean. <laughs> right, that would that would be uh, that would be news to me. But um, maybe uh, maybe that person's got a formula that we don't know about. But uh, that that sounds like it would be uh, bad news. Uh, what about um, first? You know, I mean, when I use these test kits, I I, I just don't let my Salford test kit run out and grab another one off the shelf and start using it. I mean, if I have to, I will, and I don't see bad test kits, but I'll have four or five test kits I buy once and I'll check them the alkalinity with each kit all in the line and I'll put a check mark on the top of the box to know that it's a good kit so when mine runs out I grab a kit has a check mark on the top of the box that kit's been tested to the other kits oh, that I interesting. you know yeah. yeah so I know that I'm not 
getting a bad kid. All of a sudden, oh, my house 20. Well, maybe the kid's right. bad. <laughs> yeah, right. That would be the first thing I would check. <laughs> Right, right. What, what about, um, you mentioned Cockwasser, and I saw this question earlier in the chat. I can't remember who um, who asked it, but uh, pH, how important is pH in your systems? I, I You know, I don't check it. Honestly, the, in the reef room, which is the 900-gallon display tank. Uh, and I'm going to show some of the videos mine. here. I think the first one I'm going to show was the, uh, the 600-gallon. The... Uh, First one should be the 900. Oh, the first one's a 9. Okay, gotcha. 9. That one's 12 feet long. I think it's 30 or 32 inches tall and 4 that's feet. That's amazing, man. I love the aquascape in there, too. Yeah, that's some uh, man-made rock that uh, Victor from Worldwide Corals oh. turned me on to it. How, how, a buddy. How was that in <laughs> terms of cycling? Yeah, I was not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a long time, and I set that tank up pristine. I didn't put anything seeded in the tank whatsoever. No seeded live rock. Oh, nothing. man, so that was a lot of growing pans then, huh? Yeah, it, it took a while, you know. And to seed, to, uh, seed it, I put like a, a couple raw shrimp in. Oh. Just to like, deteriorate, yeah. you know, to, to decompose. Yep, 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 yep. It took over. A, it took over a year. It took over a year before it was kind of like ready to grow corals. You know, of course, in a few months or less, I had some corals in there, and they weren't doing great. But it took a year for it to really start start to take off, for sure. Did um did you start any other tanks uh, with dry rock, or was that kind of like the first one you did? First one that was a new a new thing that I wanted to try. You know, to make a totally try a totally clean system yeah. you know as far as those little brittle stars the little asterina starfish <laughs> the uh, aftasia anemones any of the goofy stuff that you fight you know what yeah. i'm saying that i didn't want that i that i wanted to try to have something and right. it worked it right worked, you know? but you got what yeah. do you got dinos or something or it's a crazy algae yeah it just got dinos and different crazy algaes and yeah, yeah I, had, I had a bad experience <clears throat> starting a tank with dry rock only uh, my first attempt. And, um, yeah, it was um, not a fun experience. No, I mean, it blew my mind a couple times. I mean, I had acros doing good in there, and all of a sudden those dinos started going crazy. I swear two or three times a day I was blowing everything off so it didn't kill the acros. And I ended up unhooking the skimmer. Oh, yeah. And feeding more. And honestly, I left the skimmer unhooked for <coughs> two years. Really? <laughs> yeah. And I just started in the past probably four or five months getting a little bit of, I lost a little bit of color in the acros. The phosphates were hanging a little, little bit higher than yep. I wanted. And I was like, you know, I haven't had that skimmer hooked up. I awfully, awfully, actually took it offline and out of the reef room <laughs> <laughs> and put it in storage. I was like, it should have a skimmer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, that's uh, usually a key component. Right. And everything, I didn't want to put it back on because everything was so perfect. But just out of nowhere, it just started, uh, I guess, something how the systems change yep. or stabilize, whatever. And I put the skimmer back on and did a little bit of hair algae was coming, disappeared, and uh, the color started popping again in the acros within a couple weeks to a month, yeah. you know. So, so would you um, yeah. would you start another tank, a new tank with dry rock only, or you just uh, was that your only one and only attempt? No, I'll yeah. do it. What what uh, what would you do differently? Try to nothing? nothing. Just deal with the ugly stage. Patience in this hobby, man. If you don't have patience, and it's not the right. Yeah, hobby. <laughs> no, that is so true. I mean, it's um, it's easy to get frustrated, but you know, a lot of it is common sense. You know, and that sounds like what you, uh, that's kind of like how you learned was, uh, you know, kind of like learning from what, um, you know, you were doing and just using some common sense to try to like, um, you know, tackle certain issues and problems. Exactly. And it is frustrating. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that think, you know, I can touch a tank and it's perfect. Yeah. Nah, man. It's a lot yeah. of work. You know, I have corals die. Just like everybody else, I have algae blooms and stuff that'll drive you crazy. And, uh, you know, it's a passion. You, you know, the passion for the hobby. You love it. 
you're going to get yeah. through it. You're going to... Another reason having multiple systems is good too. Yeah, right. Usually there's, uh, you know, it increases the odds of having, you know, successful tanks versus, you know, you're always going to have a clunker or two in the bunch. You know, I've got like, um, I got two display tanks and, and three frag tanks. And it's always like one tank is uh, kind of like the thorn on my side, you know, but it's tough to kind of like be perfect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of those thorn in your side tanks, I've had them, you know, I have, I've just ripped them down a raceway that just won't lose this algae. And it's on a system with three other raceways in a display tank. Everything's fine. Everything's the same, same light, same flow, same everything. But the one raceway just won't cooperate. That's bizarre. And long, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Let, let, <laughs> yeah. I've had similar uh, issues because I've got um, two frag tanks to, uh, plumbed into one display tank and and sometimes it's like the display tank that's um you know giving me grief or one time you know it could be like one of the frag tanks in the line uh it's kind of hard to explain you know because they're all using the same water you know they got the same lighting pretty much it's you know i guess the one difference is maybe the flow but um flow that's in there the fish that can be in there you know sometimes the fish team up and to eat every spot of algae, you know. I mean, there's different variables, and then, <laughs> then you try to take the fish from the one and put it in the other and switch, and then it still doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's, it's a, it's, it's, it's not common, you know. It's rare, but it does happen. You know, obviously, it's, it's just all part of it that uh, they have that. So, um, Keith Hargis is asking. This is a good question. At what levels of phosphate and nitrate do you find um, changes acropore? colors so um is this the leading cause of color shifting question mark i'm running 0.4 phosphates and 65 nitrates haha my acros look healthy though wow those are elevated yeah they're elevated you know all there's all systems are different you know i, I find when my phosphates go up like that i lose colors yeah i don't necessarily find that the acros will die but they'll lose colors I even find some LPS. I've had a, I had a chalice problem. The chalice is years and years ago, receding, but the acros are doing good. And like, but the phosphates were high. I brought the phosphates down and they. So it's. What do you uh, uh, What do you use for a phosphate test kit? I find it very frustrating that uh, a lot of test kits I use, <clears throat> you know, I just get a lot different um, readings, and it's it just seems it's very tough to kind of nail down exactly what the phosphate is in a tank. <laughs> the Hanna digital light meter yeah. <clears throat> and i don't check phosphates that often honestly you know once a month once every three months i mean i'll kind of keep checking occasionally but if i see something losing color or something not right of course i'm going to check the phosphates but that's not something that i'm on all the time right and i'm not finding them high often yeah. either I did in the uh, reef room that 900 gallon tank, but I quickly checked them when I noticed that the uh, acros didn't have the pop that I liked. Like, I wonder if the phosphates are high again, you know? And sure enough, they're like 0.09 or one or whatever, you know? I like 0 0.04, 0 0.03 or zero. You even like zero? Yeah, I'm fine with that. With a bigger established system with. Lots of sponge and fish and all in there, right, you know? Right, right. So you, do, you, uh, do you feed your fish pretty heavily in the systems? Mm, I try not to because I, I have them. I got a lot of tangs, and they're there to do one thing, and they're there to work. <laughs> <laughs> you start spoiling those fish, then all of a sudden they're not doing their job. I'm showing the second video, you by know? the way. I'm showing uh -huh. the second video now. Yeah. Okay. Start seeing algae and stuff pop up here and there because you're over – Overfeeding the fish, the algae may not be because you're putting too much nutrients in there. It's because your fish are getting lazy. You know, who wants to go hunt for a deer if they got a steak put in front of them? <laughs> <every year? laughs> and that's it's the truth. They will get lazy. Yeah. I feed normal. Uh, that's my the main food. And I, I feed uh, rods, frozen. Okay. You said nori. Yep. Nori. Yep. I go through a lot of nori yep, for your tanks. Yep. yep. Nori on the clips. Yep. Um. Somebody was asking a question about um, what are you using to keep the nitrates and phosphates, um, you know, at the levels that you want to keep them at. Water changes. Water changes. So skimming, water changes. Skimming, water changes. 
you know, I'm not running carbon or GSO or. You're not or using macro, no uh, refugiums or anything? No. I mean, sometimes I kind of think it might make stuff a little easier sometimes in the raceways and all, but. But then I don't want it to suck too much out, too much nutrient and stuff out, you know, and then I don't have the vibrant colors in the corals. It's a really fine line. Yeah, and I, and I assume that your corals are, are doing some of that work, too, in terms of absorbing some of the nitrates and the phosphates. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. What about um, yeah. Trevor King's wondering, you got any UV sterilizers on your tanks? No. no. Yeah. You know, I think... Um, for me, I'm I'm running UV now on my uh, my two systems, and I'm I'm doing it more kind of like as a uh, want to hedge against any dinos that might pop up. You know, I think like the yeah. uh, the free floating uh, dinos. That's always, I guess, something to uh, to worry about. And um, you know, I'm I'm you know, in in terms of fish disease, coral uh, disease, I'm not exactly sure how effective a UV sterilizer is, but um, I do think it uh, it seems to um, be um, you know pretty good in terms of the way I've been using it. Um, ICP testing. Do you do any of that stuff? No, I mean, I have before on occasion. Um, I forgot his name right now. The guy that, that owns that ICP in Colorado. What was his name? Yeah. Oh. Whatever. He's corals for me a couple of times before. And he's, when I sent him corals, he, uh, checked the perimeters with his tests with the water that in the bags that I set in the corals in and everything was fine. Do you never, you, you never got I, like any uh, thing out of whack? Not that I know. I, you know, I doing the water changes. It takes the bad stuff out, puts good stuff in, you know, trace elements and yep. all that. Yeah, I know there's a lot of ways to do it. And I know there's a lot of people in the crowd in the audience right now. It's like, I've never done a water change. <laughs> in my life. That was, Maybe you didn't. Maybe your corals are awesome looking. You know, there's a lot of different systems. There's a lot of different ways. That's what works for me. Yeah, no, I mean, that's yeah. the beauty of this hobby, right, man? I mean, it's like there's so many different ways to skin this cat. Um, there's there's not right. just one, you know, can way to run a reef tank. Right. But, you know, exactly. I think, you know, what you do is you uh, you find success, and then you kind of stick with those methods, and you just try to, like, um, be diligent and and uh you know repeat what you've been doing to to have success and and you know it's it's easy in this day and age with social media and and um you know all the uh the people out there that um you know run a tank a certain way and some people are um you know more vocal about it than others and and um but uh yeah you know it's it's uh it can be tough i think for a new person that's getting into the hobby to try to get some clarity in terms of, um, you know, how to run a reef tank because there's just so much information out there versus like what you're talking about before when, uh, you know, we pretty much just had books and, uh, you yeah. know, magazine articles and, and things like that. There wasn't the social media to uh, confuse everybody. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. My tank doesn't look like the cover of the book. So what's wrong? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, What's some of the other, um, oh yeah, the uh, feeding. Do you feed any, your corals any food? Any um, special uh, things you target uh, for the corals or broadcast feed? No, I mean, I feed a little bit of the rods frozen, reef food, reef blend or whatever. They're, and uh, that's it. And it's not even every day. Um, I have a copper band butterfly fish that I've had for many years that I'll, that he gets it every day. But uh, as far as the tanks, a couple times a week at the most with the frozen. So, no, I'm not doing anything. And you're not dosing any special uh, trace elements or anything like that. You're just pretty much leaning on the, the water changes. That's it. I'm not dosing anything. I want to show the um, a couple more of uh, your videos here. This is a – I think this was video number four. That um, it's it's a uh, it's a top down shot of some serious looking uh, acro colonies, and I also I see a um, grafted monty, the green and uh, yeah, that's the nine hundred. That's in the that's another yep. top down of the uh, the nine hundred. Yep. Man, oh man, that's uh, I could I could see how you could you need to do some serious pruning in that tank, man. A lot, you know. 
to all the tanks and raceways. I mean, it's always growing. It's a lot of, uh, I'm doing a lot of fragging, man. I could do a lot of blows. <laughs> <laughs> we're, and we're looking at uh, another video here with the um, raceways under the, uh, the LED lighting. I think somebody had asked this question in terms of what kind of spectrum do you favor? It looks like in this uh, video here, it looks very blue, but is that just the time blue. of the day? No, I'm blue. I'm You're all, all blue. blue. Yeah, I got that from diving. It's really blue when you're down there diving in the South Pacific. What? Uh, so, what are you? Um, what are you using in terms of uh, LEDs? What? Uh, what? What fixtures? I'm using uh, Ecotech. That uh, 900 gallon tank has Ecotech radions, and it's got uh, T5s on it. And on my raceways, I'm using some custom Chinese LEDs fixtures. They only have blue and UV in them. Oh, really? No white, reds, greens, nothing. Wow. And, uh, yep. Um, what? A and I'm using, right where I have T fives, like on the uh, seven hundred gallon tank. I've got T fives, and I've got reef bright strips down the center of the T fives. Are you concerned at all in terms of the par in those tanks? Do you measure that at all, or is that just um, something that you're not uh, worried about? No. Yeah. I love it, man. It's just like the simple approach here. Yeah, no, I don't check par, you know, and I don't think corals need quite as much light as a lot of people think they do. Also, you know, I think the most important things flow, honestly, flow and water quality. Yeah, you had some, uh, you had some serious, um, were, the, were those the panther ray pumps in the uh, 900? How many panther rays yeah. you got in that thing? That one's got um, three of the big cannons, the big man. ones. ECM, uh, I don't even remember. Whatever they are. Those well, are there's ones. no way you could have sand in that tank for sure, man. No. <laughs> and then having sand, I think tanks will get kind of old tank syndrome too, having sand, especially the big ones. You know, you can't get in there and clean it. And you've got your live rocks in the sand. You ever pull one of those rocks out? <clears throat> that was down in the sand the end of the piece of rocks blue kind of and it stinks yeah. like a, you know what i'm saying yep. i mean i um doesn't mean it doesn't work no nah, absolutely there's some awesome looking tanks out there with sand beds and uh awesome but i've never been able to keep like a clean sand bed you know i've always had pretty you know messed up sand beds and that's just like pieces of coral or dead you know snail shells and and uh, all that stuff just kind of accumulates i get a little lazy and and uh you know so i've got one of my display tanks is bare bottom that's a peninsula tank and i had no choice because i got so much flow in that tank that uh, like your 900 it's just it's I, you know i gotta push a lot of water since it's a peninsula from one end to the other and it's an sbs dominant tank yeah. so um i didn't even think about putting sand in that tank and i like it i like it a lot it's a clean look you know and I don't have to worry about the messed up bottom. And then I got my other display tank that, um, you know, I I, uh, I grew out a whole bunch of corals in that. It just got choked out with corals. So I, I rebooted the whole system like uh, a few months ago. And I and I put some, um, so I had some Haitian live rock in that uh, tank. And I uh, plumbed in a, a cryptic sump. And, and this Haitian live rock, I've talked about this before on the show, was probably 95% of it was encrusted with coral. So, um, you know, I couldn't really like, start planting, you know, pulling out colonies and start planting frags on top of the encrusted coral. It just wouldn't have worked. You know, the encrusted coral would have like probably overtaken the, uh, the frags and all that stuff. So I decided to, um, put in some carob sea life dry rock, which I had cooking in a Rubbermaid tub for like months. And, um, I was doing water changes with my other, you know, my established system. So it was, um, it was definitely, uh, cooking pretty nicely in that Rubbermaid, hundred gallon Rubbermaid for, uh, for several months. So, um, but you know now it's in my uh, display tank. I swapped it. I put I put the uh, the dry rock in the uh, display tank, and I put the Haitian live rock in the um, in the cryptic sump. And um, you know I had this like serious calcified sand bed in that uh, display tank, and I was pulling out like chunks of sand like that big that yeah. um, just had calcified. And and so you know what's left now is like just um, you know not it, it's it's sand in there, but it's not a lot of sand. And so I'm, I'm, I'm fighting some like algae issues. I'm getting a little green cyano on that sand bed. And, and, um, you know, so I think ultimately I'd like to pull out the whole sand bed 
just make it even uh, even cleaner. But um, you know, I'll keep uh, I'll keep fighting the fight. You know, I've, I've been getting a little algae on the uh, on the rocks too. So I think you know, I think that stuff's been leaching some phosphates. Um, you know, in in that tank. Do you um do you dose phosphate or nitrates at all, or do you pretty much just kind of like feed more or less just to try to like um, raise and lower the nitrates and the phosphates? I you know I've never really. Besides the 900 in the reef room when I had those dinos, I've never really uh, tried to raise nitrates or phosphates ever since that time. Yeah. yeah. What about, um, you know, other things like pests and what have you? How do you, um, how do you prevent pests from, uh, from getting in your system? Do you have like a whole quarantine system set up before you put corals into your, um, you know, your main display tanks and your raceways? Yeah, I've got multiple stages of quarantine. I mean, I'll quarantine for months up to even a year, you know, I mean, (laughs) yeah, I'm pretty super anal about quarantine. I got too much, too much at stake going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just many, many years ago when I first started in this, I had, uh, Monty Nudebranks. It's just a nightmare. I I chucked all the Montes. I took little teeny frags off of each one. Put them on a rack in their own quarantine system for probably a wow. year. Scrub them every week with iodine and change the rack. And uh, yeah, I never want to experience something <laughs> like that again, just, especially at the size it is now. It's just <laughs> yeah, right. You, they get in. I mean, it's like pretty much impossible once they get into a big display tank, right? Once in there, it's pretty much impossible. Yeah. Like I took little frags. All the colonies went in the trash. Yeah. Just little frags, and they stayed in their own system. My main system stayed Monty free for at least a, it was about a year, I right. would say. And I mean, that was a long, long time ago. That was probably fifteen years ago. Yep. What about um, like acro eating flatworm? What's your protocol when you get like? I mean, are you, you're. I'm assuming you're still collecting, uh, bringing in wild corals, or um, you're not doing that anymore. I mean, I will again someday, but since the pandemic hit, I haven't been overseas dying and I haven't brought in any, any wild stuff. So what stuff. would be your protocol if you, you know, you know, before the pandemic, you picked up some wild pieces or whatnot, you saw acro eating flatworms. I'm assuming maybe like a lot of those pieces had, uh, um, you know, the flatworms on them. What, um, what, what kind of like uh, regiment would they go through in terms of dipping and, and what were you using and all that stuff? Cut the bases. If it's a big colony, I'll just take a couple frags off the colony and chuck the yeah. rest. And then dip them every yep. week. Right. For months, months and months and months and months. And then those pieces from the colonies, I'll take a little frag, like a quarter of an inch off of that, and I'll put it in another quarantine and dip and dip and dip. And, and, you know, it's so small, the odds of just that little frag having the flatworms, especially after the other piece was dipped and dip, and then take that and put another, and then take that and grow it a little bit, and take the little nub off of that nub, and then finally, eventually go into the display. Tank. Right, right. So you're just, pretty much you've got many barriers there set up to uh, prevent that. Because, uh, again, you know, acro-eating flatworms getting in a display tank, and ain't, that ain't easy to get rid of them. Yeah. No. I had them in a display tank. Of course, I'm having had them in quarantine tanks plenty of times. Right. And they get into a quarantine tank, and even that's a nightmare. How do you uh, how do you address that if they get into a quarantine tank? Anything that doesn't look like it's got potential, chuck it. <laughs> Basically, chuck anything that you don't think special. Yep. And take little cuttings off of them and chuck the bases and then keep dipping them and you'll get rid of them. Right, you'll break the life cycle if you just dip, dip them every week for months. Yeah, and then don't keep all the stuff. It's not going to be something special. Just get rid of it. Especially, you know, when I've got so many corals around like I do. <clears throat> if I don't think it's going to be special, then there's no sense in even starting the dip right. process. <laughs> right. you know? What about like... Um, Parasitic uh, copepods like uh, you know red bugs, black bugs, all that stuff. Do you have a um, like a protocol set up to um, you know prevent those from getting in your systems? Interceptor, intercept stuff, and I, I I don't I don't have that stuff in my systems, but I'll still intercept the systems once a year, once every couple years or right. something, just 
to do right. it. You never know. You never yeah. know. And it's like the corals like it too. Oh yeah. The polypy after you put interceptor, so can't now, hurt. What what about um yeah. what what are what are some other uh, pests besides um the uh the aqua eating flatworms, the uh, parasitic cold pods and, and um the monty eating uh nudies. Anything else that um you know we as hobbyists should be concerned about sea spiders. Is that a something that's a uh... zoanthid eating spider, zoanthid eating nudibranchs? That stuff's easier to get rid of. I've had them in quarantine systems, and they're a lot easier to get rid of than like uh, acro flatworms. I'd say the hardest thing would be a uh, monopore nudibranchs. You know, if I get a monopore frag, it better be something special. I'll never take the colony. I'll just take a frag off of it, and I'll put super glue on the bottom of it, blob it into epoxy, let it grow across. Then I'll cut the circle out of the middle again. Really? Chuck the rest. Really? Put that and let that encrust. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll definitely, I'll probably take a year to get a money from quarantine and in this place, even if I never saw uh, money uh, eating nudibrank. Wow. Yeah. I'm not. Better safe than sorry, man, right? And people don't realize they have them sometimes. They've got a rash or something that's keeping them at bay. But if you pull that colony out and you flip it upside down under a light, <laughs> they find them up in there, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, a lot of people would share and say, oh, there's no way there's a money uh, new to brankliness. Well, you mind if I flip it over? Go ahead. <laughs> oh, there's one. <laughs> Percy Adams is asking, any advice for vermitids? Fermented snails. No, I have super glue. Super glue. Super I've had some success with the uh, bumblebee uh, snails. I mean, not uh, you know they haven't knocked them out, but they seem to have like you know kind of um, knocked the uh, population back a little bit. Okay, all right. But chisel off maintenance. You know, go in there with your. I've got a big dive knife that I work with in the tanks a lot. It's a big old stainless scuba pro dive knife, and I'll go in there and whack at stuff and you know you see knock those things off the rocks and stuff yeah so mass removal definitely helps aptasia copper band peppermint shrimp yep, peppermint shrimp work well for me <clears throat> just yeah. uh you can't have any hawkfish in the in the system that's all, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's like nice little appetizer <laughs> for the peppermint yeah. shrimp um uh, oh, um, John Wright, hi from England. Uh, Refum, does Jason dose phytoplankton at all? Any phyto? Nope. No. It's real simple, man. I mean, you you just you know, it's a real it's it's a uh, it's a very refreshing approach, and 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 the colors that you get out of your corals are just like amazing, and it's just a very simplistic way to keep them. Yeah, yeah. I definitely. I don't have any uh, controllers or. Anything, man. Got timers running the lights. So, all right. You mentioned you mentioned water changes. <clears throat> you mentioned flow. What else in terms of like keys to success to keeping colorful uh, acros? A lot of maintenance. A lot of work. You what's, know? what's what's your maintenance routine like? Cleaning the glass, blowing the rocks, cleaning the you know algae and. Trimming, pruning, you know, if something's not happy here, move it to another spot. You can't just walk away from it and think it's going to fix itself, you know. It's, you got to constantly be in the air messing with it. And it, 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 it is a lot of work, you know. I mean, it's it, and it's easy to become lazy as a reef keeper, you know, and, and try to like, all right, I'm going to kind of like just leave things alone and, and see if that works. But usually that's not the answer. No. Usually it's not. I mean, of course, sometimes sometimes people mess with it too much. You hear people say, oh, I stopped doing water changes. I stopped tinkering with it, and now it's doing awesome. Well, yeah, that's definitely too can happen. You can do too much stuff sometimes too, you know what I'm saying? But for a general rule of thumb, keep up doing the <laughs> Keep up on the work and maintenance. Uh, Thomas Baker is wondering, do, do, do you still pee in the tank? Laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> no, never he did. never did. <laughs> <laughs> Might spill a beer in there now and then. But <laughs> um, so Rob Upstate New York is asking: Is Jason's st uh, system s still all in the basement, or did he build another building? You have a couple buildings, right? 
I have one other building, and the 900's in the other building. That's the video that has the top down. Right. Acros. And the run one raceway, there's a raceway, I think I did a video by itself that's in that building that shows the, act, the lights on top and it shows two water change tanks in the back of the raceway. So how many different systems do you have? Main systems, I have four. And then I've got uh, some bio cubes for quarantine. I've got a 50 gallon quarantine. And the last stage of quarantine is a, a 125 hooked to a 90. Um, <laughs> What does the setup look like for the smaller quarantine tanks? You know, I mean, what kind of, in terms of the equipment do you have in those tanks? I don't really. I just do water changes. Oh, so you don't have like skimmer or filtration in there? You just do some serious water changes? No. Yeah, well, I have a small skimmer on the 125 that's hooked to the 90 because that's a little bit bigger. But uh, I still do pretty big water changes in that weekly. But on the bio cubes and on the 50, I don't have any skimmer or, or anything. Just do water changes on them. Yeah, um, yeah. Reef keepers uh, sent, sounds like he's mostly relies on water changes. How much is he doing on his big systems? Um, you, we already talked about that, right? In terms of percentage on the big, the nine hundred. The nine hundred, I'm doing probably. I'm doing. I try to do three hundred gallons a week. Sometimes it ends up being every other week. That's a big water change, man. Yeah. 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 Um. So Carlos23 is asking, Jason said he runs all blue and UV lights only. How many hours is the schedule on for? Twelve. Twelve. Yep. And is, is it ramp He's, up, ramp down? No. No. The, uh, say the blue LEDs will be on for 12 and the T5s will be on for 10. One off. No ramping anywhere. Gotcha. Another question about the... Uh, Coral quarantine. Are all those quarantine tanks fishless? No, nah, almost. But I got a couple, a tang or two in them. Do you um? Do you ever test the alkalinity in those quarantine tanks, or are you um pretty much like confident the large water changes you're doing in the quarantine tanks that you just don't need to worry about parameters? I don't worry about it. Not at yeah, all. Yeah, my uh, I got like a twenty gallon quarantine tank, and um, every week I do um. 50 gallon water change, established tank water. So I've got yeah. um, a little nano skimmer on there to like, you know, help for aeration, but it's not really skimming anything. Um, then it's, uh, you know, I got a heater, a little um, um, gyro pump in there, and a light. And that's about it. It's a few pieces of live rock, and I, you know, I'm pretty good to go. Yeah. You know, pretty simple yeah. setup. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, so let's talk about the uh, the collection part of what you, uh, you I mean you brought in some pretty freaking amazing corals, Jason, to the uh, to the hobby. What's uh, what's the story behind the home record, man? How did you find that? That one came from one of the guys over in Indo, one of the wholesalers over there. Yeah. So that's just that was like something that uh, you, you you brought in a whole bunch of um, pieces from this uh, wholesaler, and that one happened to be part of the bunch. Yeah, I wouldn't get whole colonies. I'd get a bunch of big frags off of the colonies. I wouldn't want the whole colony. And it was one of those. Wow. Yep. Yep. Right from the guy in there that I know. And you, but you also uh, were diving, right? To. Uh... Oh, yeah, a lot of diving with licensed collectors. Yeah. The home record, I, did, I didn't get diving. I got it from a. Uh, they had already collected it over there. What, um,. What would you say is like the most amazing piece you ever personally uh, collected? Ah, man, there's so many. So, I don't know. Name three of them. Uh, Rampage, man. The Raja Rampage Chalice is pretty awesome. That's one of my favorites. Really? Yeah, the way it gets the orange around the eyes. and There's a lot of nice ones. I like the Raja Rampage a lot. Sunset Styler Sonelia, that's a different one. Um, green base with orange polyps. Super different. Uh, burn and banana styler Sinelli is a nice one. Yellow with red. A lot of them. Yeah. 
I think one of my, uh, I love the home record that I, uh, that I've got. That's like an amazing, uh, tenuous. I mean, any other, uh, rainbow tenuous that, uh, you, uh, you also brought in the Walt Disney, right? No, you didn't yeah. do that. That was Mike Bigger. Mike Bigger, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yep. do you, um, I mean, do you, uh, get into the whole rainbow, uh, tenuous craze and all that stuff? I mean, I like the rainbow tenuous for sure. I've got a few of them yep. growing. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm crazy about it. I don't have tanks just full of them. <laughs> There's a lot out there. Yeah. Um, what was I going to ask you? Fox Flame. Was that something you collected or you, you uh, got from a uh, diver? See, the home record. That was a frag from a colony that I got. Yeah. From you know, right from pretty the pretty sweet. What yeah. um so um no uh no no immediate plans to go uh back over um dive or collect corals. I'm kinda of talking about trying to do it this year, but we'll see. I've been really busy and I got a lot of shows coming up and recession right now is hit, you know. So the last thing I want to do really is go traveling overseas and spending a bunch of money right now. I like the economy to pick up first yeah, a little bit. I hear you. You know, which shouldn't take too terribly long, but right now it's definitely not the best time. Seems like one thing after another, right? Pandemic, then yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, we. But talking to one of my buddies uh, from Indo uh, within the past month about trying to plan a trip yeah. over there. I missed. I really miss going over there and diving. It's been too long. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of folks here that are uh, looking forward to seeing in all these uh, frag swaps. We're talking before the live stream. You're you're pretty uh you you got a pretty heavy schedule in terms of shows. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, I've got an event schedule on my website, so the ones that I'm definitely going to so far are all on there for this year. More will be added. Cool. Yeah. Um, some more comments about corals. The, um, the Jason Fox, uh, Thomas Baker saying the jolt is sweet. That is a pretty sweet coral. Yeah, that was nice. I love the jolt. Yep. Uh, Mike H. Ratsery, Fox Flame is my absolute favorite. Um, Reefaholic, jolt is a beauty. My buddy has it and hopefully I can get a piece when he frags it. I've got, uh, I got a, uh, I got a little nub from somebody, the, uh, the Sunday driver. That's a cool coral, man. That is a really nice one. The way it gets those yellow polyps. Yeah. I mean, I, I seriously got like a, a quarter inch nub from him because he was um, doing some pruning. I think he, by mistake, knocked a little uh, nub off of it. And um, I put it through quarantine. I, I mean, how many like quarter inch frags can make it through like, uh, you know, I mean, I only do like a four you know, four week quarantine in terms of like dipping and all that stuff for uh, aquarine flatworms. And I uh, hit it a couple of times with, with interceptor. So I'm like not nearly on your level in terms of the quarantine process, but, um, corals do get kind of beat up in that process or have you kind of perfected it where, uh, they, uh, it's, it's not as uh, harsh on them. You know, you don't necessarily have to start dipping like crazy right away. I mean, if they're going to stay in quarantine, you can just leave them in there, a healthy quarantine for longer, right. let them start to encrust, let them start to grow a little bit, and then you can start beating them up a little bit. I mean, if you got something that's super special and it's small, you can let it encrust a little and then get it so you can cut that piece in half. Right. Then start dipping the piece that you cut off of it, put it in a different quarantine. Then if that dies, you still got the original little nub that you haven't started. Sounds like I need a couple more quarantine tanks. Having a... If you're trying to get corals, having those different quarantine tanks is really helpful. Um, okay, Andy's uh, reminding me to ask you this question. I've seen Rudy Batera's original colony of the Golden Basket burning candle that became the Fox Flame. Amazing coral. Yep. Talk to us about uh, Rudy. Apparently, you've uh, you've uh, got. I do a lot with Rudy. He's from Indonesia. And people he knows is some of the people I've dove with. Oh, really? Rudy's imported some corals for me also. A lot of them. Nice. Well. Wow. I'm not a... You're what? I'm not an importer. Not an importer. 
not an importer. Yeah, what's it take to be an importer? I mean, that's a whole... Uh, th a whole different thing. I'm not sure. I've let Rudy do most of my importing. Yep. Gotcha. Um, so Scott McMillan is asking, uh, does this system still run the same as when Jake Adams visited your house? Sounds like it. Pretty much. I mean, it's there's more there. When he visited, I had uh, three three foot by six foot raceways. Now they're all gone, and they're four by eights. I didn't have the nine hundred or any of that in the in the other building, in the reef room building. I had a four hundred that's gone, and now that's a five hundred. Right. Um, besides that, it's all pretty much the same. What? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the methods, it sounds like you've been pretty consistent. Besides um, lighting. Have you made any major changes in terms of, you know, your methods for, uh, for reef keeping over the years? Not really. I mean, different, different, different pumps, different yep. lights, different skimmer, different calcium reactors, basically just better equipment, same principle, better equipment, yeah. less sand. I mean, I used to use more sand back in the day and, Kind of like you said, I got most of it out, and then I still had a little, but it was almost bare bottom. <clears throat> but then I got rid of it all, because then that's almost like now I got a dirty bare bottom. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you got to keep the you know you got to siphon out the detritus, right? Right, right. And blow it and siphon it, so it just ended up with so many systems, it's just too much work having. The sand and yeah I, i'm and of course the flow but even in one with the flow it's just it's a lot of work having sand. i uh yeah i'm very close to like just completely pulling the sand out of that one system of mine but um you know it, it is um i you know if i keep it i think i'm gonna just have to do more maintaining i'm gonna have to do more siphoning of the sand i, I usually it's just you know i've got a bunch of uh, sea cucumbers in that tank and i've got some i don't have a lot of nasaria snails left anymore but uh, i used to like just kind of like you know, leave it up to the cleanup crew, but I'm not sure that's enough. Right. You know? Right. Um, so you mentioned um, blowing uh, the rocks and whatnot. What, what's your routine with that? I mean, do you take a power head and blow around the rocks uh, on all your tanks that, you know, you got rock in? Yep. Yep. Take a power, like a mag, mag drive six or seven or whatever. I think it's a six. Get in there and just blow all in the dead spots and corners and crevices and blow all and blow under the rocks ah. you know all my tanks have a pump going across the back bottom that kind of pushes flow across the back and then out through the rocks towards the front the front of yep. the tank so it'll kind of when i'm siphoning the corners it'll kind of be the front corners of the tank that'll get the detritus and stuff not anywhere in the back or anything it all blows out towards the front kind of that's the great thing with the bare bottom tank. It's like so easy to kind of see where that try to settles and you can just siphon it right up. Yep. And control where it settles, you know, with your flow, where you have your yeah, flow. Yeah, I don't know how it worked out, but in my peninsula tank, it all like settles kind of like in the front end of that tank. And it's just super easy to siphon it out. I mean, I, I really, you know, I, I, I did a, I try to do my, my best in terms of keeping you know, the rock, um, not having a lot of rock contacting the bottom, right? You want to, like, try to have as many, um, as, as few contact points as possible. You don't want to, like, lay a piece of rock flat on the bottom of a tank, right? Because that could just be a detritus trap. Uh, exactly. How often do you uh, go, get in there with the power and blow around? You know, it doesn't happen as much. I like to do it every week. A couple weeks. Every couple weeks would be ideal. Every week would be ideal. Every couple weeks is fine. And you could go by how much dirt is coming out of the rocks. If you got it's a lot of dirt's coming out in certain areas, you need to do it a little more often. If you're not getting much out of it, then less. How do you um how do you handle like if you ever get cyano or bryopsis, like problematic algae? What um what what do you try to like um you know do to, to get rid of that stuff? I mean, Barobsis is easy. It's get that. Uh, I used to use that Fluco. Fluconazole. Fluconazole or whatever. And uh, now I just use that reflux yeah. stuff. And I use a tiny, tiny bit. will get rid of it. I mean, use like a, 
a hundredth of what they say or something. Really? I mean, they say, oh, my God. Like, if you use just one of those capsules for a thousand gallons or two, maybe, capsules, it's it, it knocks it out. And they say use one for every 10 gallons or something. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you really don't need much huh. of it. And then it'll knock the bropsis right out. And, uh, you know, the cyanose and all that. I mean, manual, rat, manual removal. Sometimes that stuff just goes through its cycle and just blow it off with a power head, siphon it out, scrub with the toothbrush. I, and, I think uh, manual removal, you know, for, for a lot of different algae is like so important, you know, and um, I think that um, chemicals like ChemiClean, it's, um, you know, you're, you're kind of rolling the dice a little bit there. You don't know exactly, you know, it's, it's, it, there could be a lot of collateral damage with the, uh, with the bacteria population in the tank. I mean, it's a quick fix. And I always, you know, say like, well, if you're going to hit a tank with ChemiClean and you're not solving that root cause of what's causing the, you know, the, uh, the cyano, it's eventually going to come back, you know? Right. But, um, I think manual remover is, is so important because, you know, if you have good, I'm assuming you've got good mechanical filtration or what have you. Um, but, um, yeah, you get it into the water column, let the mechanical filtration remove it. Because if you just leave whatever algae you've got in that tank, then it's there to absorb all the nitrates and the phosphates, and that's going to screw you up. Yeah, I mean, it can be a pain in the butt sometimes, but it seems like it'll go through its cycle, you know. Out of nowhere, you'll start getting some of that red slime or something show up and blow it, blow it, blow it, clean it, clean it. Might have to do it a few weeks in a row. Worst case scenario, maybe kick the lights from in half. Don't shut them off, but just less light. You know, your acros might lose a little color during that time. Let's say you have them on 12, put them down to 6. Right. Manual removal, 6 hours of light. You see it disappear, kick the lights back up to 12, and a lot of times it's gone. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of like what I'm doing right now with the with I've got this kind of like green cyano in, in the one display tank, and I'm I'm basically taking the power head <clears throat> every day and blowing on on the rocks, getting the uh, the algae into the water column, and then um, you know I let my mechanical filtration do its thing, and I'm cleaning the uh, you know I got some hundred uh, micron filter socks in in the line there, and I clean the filter socks every day, you know, so every day I'm blowing, I'm cleaning the filter socks. So it's just manual removal, okay. just removing as much as I can manually, and um, you know I'm seeing some progress. So I think but that's that's true with any anything like you were saying, cyano, you know, red cyano, whatever. It's um, it's the same deal. Um, somebody's asking what what about dinos and and um, uh, Jason mentioned before that basically you just you stop skimming on that tank, the 900 that had the uh, the dinos, right? And um, just kind of like um, I guess the higher nutrients helped uh, beat it back. It beat it back. I stopped. I turned the skimmer off, started feeding a little extra and blowing the rocks constantly through a filter, you know, letting a filter sock collect that and uh, disappeared. Um, somebody's asking a question. So you mentioned you're using reef crystals. Were you always using reef crystals or um, Reef Keeper thought for some reason that you were using regular IL? I was. I was using regular IO. I just got sick of adding uh, calcium and magnesium to it. Yeah, I was using uh, regular IO for a long time, and uh, just a lot of mag. I, I kept add, having to add a lot of magnesium to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only reason that I switched. Um, so John Gordon is wondering about your mechanical filtration. Are you using uh, filter uh, socks? Filter yeah. socks. And that's it. Skimmer filter sucks. You're not a uh, a fleece filter roll guy. Yeah, no. never, never, uh, never tried that myself. Mm. Um. So we got going on here. Yeah, any, folks. Any other questions? Just uh, just drop them in the uh, in the uh, in the chat. Um. What about corals that um, you would like to acquire, but don't have at this point anything out there that um you've seen that uh man i'd love to have that in, in uh you know my collection mm, not, not lately, lately. <laughs> not really. <laughs> yeah i mean there's so, i have so many corals all over the place man that it's just 
Yeah, occasionally. It's, it's hard to get one. It really gets me excited. It's something new anymore. I mean, it happens. But I haven't seen anything lately. Um, I got to get back over to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, GT500 Shelby, is Jason doing any uh, dosing, any bacteria? Any of that stuff? Nope. nope. I didn't think so. <laughs> no, I've never dosed anything. I've never used any of the Kimmy Pures or anything for allergies. I've never, I'm scared to use any of that. Or, you know, I'm not doing it. Uh, another question, JP Reef. Ozone, have you ever used ozone? Never. Ozone kind of scares me. I uh, mean, you know, back in the day, I used to hear about it. I haven't heard about it for years. You know? Yeah. I've never read it. Uh, all right, here's a good question. Andy's got this a good question. Um, so what's your protocol, uh, Jason, if you get some RTN or STN in your tank? You know, do you, um, do, you do anything in, you know, specifically to, uh, to address any of those kind of events? Frag it. Frag it. Frag it. Frag it away. Don't cut it right at the RTN line. Get into the good flesh a half of an inch or an inch, you know what I'm saying? And make a batch of frags. So just try to nip it in the bud. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing else you can really do besides start to frag it. Yep. As far as I know. And make sure you got backups in different systems. Yes, that is, uh, if you can have multiple systems, that is great advice for sure. Absolutely. I like to have three or four backups of everything. Yeah. When I started. I mean. Yeah. yeah like anybody else, you know, if there's anybody out there that said they never had an acro smoke overnight, then they're not growing acros or the lion. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it just happens. I mean, it's, it happens on the reef. I'll be diving out on the reef in Indo. The beautiful reef. Colonies of acros all over the place. Right in the middle of all the healthy acros, there's one. That you know it just died within the past couple days. White skeleton, fresh white skeleton. It just happens. Back them up, frag them up, get multiple colonies growing. Have you ever been worried about uh, bacterial infections? Yeah, I mean, I've had it before. And, it, and I don't know where they even come from. You know, you maybe hadn't introduced a coral into a system for two years. All of a sudden, you got a colony of... of uh, Stylophora that's just got that infection walking across it. If you don't get that out of there, that's what happens when somebody has a tank crash because it'll spread from colony to colony to colony and start wiping your colonies out. You got to get it out. And how do you treat that coral? Throw it in the trash and frag the good ends off. That's it. Yeah. I know there's other people can dip it in antiviral, bacterial, and all this. I cut the frag off. I take a bunch of frags off of it, a half an inch to an inch into the good flesh, and make a batch of frags out of it, and grow your colony back out. Grow a few of yeah. them. Out. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's good to have the real estate to be able to um, to be able to um, back up the backups. Yeah. Right. Um. All right. They get some buddies in the hobby, you know. I know a lot of people do that. Spread that frag Thank out. the coral. You, first thing you should do is give a piece to your buddy. Yeah, thank it for sure. Yep. Um, we got a lot of random questions here, uh, Jason, so I'm going to start asking some of these. Uh, John Gordon, is there a particular brand of plugs, discs that you prefer? Uh, what's the guy? Uh, Gooch from... Uh, it's been so many years. I buy so many of them. The guy Gooch, he's up in Wisconsin. Corals? I is is uh -huh. it Gooch Corals? Not Gooch Corals. That's his name. Oh. That's his nickname, I think. But sorry, I don't remember the company of his frag plugs that I'm using. I don't remember. Um, Carlos23, with the reef crystals, do you bring down the alk in the uh, alkalinity and the salt? No. No, no way. I do water changes. That helps getting that alkalinity up. All the corals are are pulling it out. If you're trying to use the reef crystals and you're, it's got too high of alkalinity for you, I think the regular Instant Ocean has a lower alkalinity, doesn't it? I'm not, I'm not sure. 
Probably. Right. Uh, Probably. Um, Reap the Sea Forever. How many Fox Narachnopora are there out there? Anacroporas? Yeah. How many you got out there? I have the TNT Anacropora. Um, I think there's only two right now. Are there? Not many. There's a Reef Raft one. The uh, Tropicana Anacropora. I've got that growing. Then there's the Bi uh, Bio Reefs Green Goblin and Acropora, the green one. I think Worldwide Corals calls it the Slime Ball. Okay. But I think it's the same one. And the TNT is the red one. Um, what about, um, you know, like a rainbow splice type of uh, coral, you know, like the grafting thing that's going on? Um, I think I saw it. Top Shelf Aquatics uh, did some some splicing with uh, with a couple of their corals. Is that something that you've gotten into at all in terms of uh, you know trying to like splice corals together? I don't think that you can splice them together. They all grow up to each other, but they're not going to actually fuse. The grafted Montes and all it's, it's kind of the wrong name. They're not like grafted. They're out of the ocean like that. People think because it's called a grafted cap, it's grafted together, but you got to get it out of the ocean with both colors in it. And then when you're propagating it, you got to have both colors in the frags to get both colors out yeah. of them. And there's aquapores like that rainbow splice that has uh, both colors yep. in them out of the ocean. And that one's really similar to an old uh, Tyree had a, a grafted Millie. Many many years ago, that reminds me of the graph that that uh, rainbow splice. Do you remember the name of that? Uh... I think it was just called the graph Tyree graph oh, yeah. Millie. I'm not positive. It's been many years, but I think if you Google Tyree graph Millie, that probably somehow or another you could come up. I had it years ago. I ended up losing it. Didn't have a backup. What? No. Taught me to have backups. You know? <laughs> what was your uh, like favorite old old school uh, SPS coral? Like you know, back when you were kind of like really getting into it and all that stuff, and you know, there was like some pretty interesting stuff coming out, like from Tyree and all on all that stuff. What was like your top uh, you know favorite SPS corals? You know, kind of like old school SPS. I like the Aura Pearlberry. Yeah, that's a sweet. That thing's, like, not, that thing's incredible. There's a lot of fakes yeah. out there. Yeah, there is. You can tell the real one when you see it in a second there, okay? Yeah. Um, that, the uh, Oregon yeah. Tort. You know, that thing's awesome. It is. The blue, that thing, yeah. You know, the Tyree Ultimate Stag. Red Dragon. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Classics. Yep. Uh, Classics. Uh, so, uh, Polo1126, uh, one, one, what is Jason's favorite acro? All time. All time. Yeah, you had to just put uh, one one at the top. I mean, the Fox Flames really nice. And it is. The, the blue, the uh, the, not the, the the jolt. The jolt's really nice. I like the jolt for sure. Of course, I like the home record yeah. too. You know, but they don't have to be the super high end expensive rags to be really nice. You know, even the old school like Worldwide Corals yellow tips. Really nice acro. Yeah, you know? I, uh, you know, there's another one. The uh, the Milka Stylo is like a gorgeous coral, and and that's yeah. like you know yeah. that could be like a twenty dollar frag or something like that, or or uh, I mean it grows like a weed, and that thing's just got such serious purple coloration. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty wicked cool. Um, Definitely. What else? Um, there's a lot of nice acros. You know, you, it doesn't have to be a five hundred or a thousand dollar acro. Nope. That there is some very, very nice, reasonable acros out there. Absolutely. Um, Thomas Baker is wondering, are you going to release an Acropora uh, speciosa? No, I haven't had good luck with them, man. I tried a couple frags I got, and they lasted for a while and petered out, you know. So, why... The, the corals that don't want to do good, and it's not just me with the species. Everybody's got <laughs> problems. I know there's people that, oh, I've got a colony growing for, well, you know what I'm saying? It, like their tank, of course. But in general, a lot of people have problems with them. Add stress to the hobby, man. 
You know what yeah. I'm saying? <laughs> Why add more stress to it? To grow something that's going to live. Right. What What other kinds of uh, acros do you uh, think are difficult? Like, um, you know, are um, spatulata? I know those can be a challenge. They can, you know, highlight, high flow. You know what I'm saying? It's definitely, they can be a challenge. I, I think a lot of the ones that are collected in shallow water can be a pretty good challenge too. They slime a lot. And you can tell the ones that are collected in shallow water that go with low tides, they're out of the water and they slime like crazy. And it seems like those are a little bit difficult to keep. Yeah, we're getting some comments here. Uh, Bert Minshew, speciosa is extremely uh, delicate. I had a hermit crawl over a um, speciosa and killed it, ripped the skin right off. Yeah. Um, yep. So uh, Reefa Hog mentions the uh, ORA Red Planet. That's a gorgeous coral. That's a nice That's one. That's a real nice one. Old Satosa. Orange Satosa, man. Bright orange. Yeah. That's a nice one. I yeah. love it. Common, regular, been around forever, and then awesome. Yep. Um, what else am I seeing here? Any uh, any other uh, comments in terms of corals that uh, Jason has? Oh, yeah. What, what, what about the um, um, jack-o'-lantern? What's the story behind that? The jack-o'-lantern came from a wholesaler. And uh, Australia, that's from Australia. Things incredible, old school. I've um, I've never tried a chalice. You know, I've I've heard that uh, they can be um, a little aggressive, right, with other corals sting. They can. They've got some sweeper tentacles. Yeah. By the bigger the eye on the chalice, the more tentacles it out. Longer the tentacles it can put out. But I like them. I mean, they're nice. Give them a little bit of space. Blue reef. Hawkins, or a Hawkins, man, that's a sweet coral. Yep, that was nice. Yeah, uh, and it's not, as far as I know, I, I've never said that I'm an expert on scientific names of corals, and I try not to put a lot of scientific names on my website, if any. Um, but that Hawkins is not an echinata. Oh, it's not. It's a is it Taraki? <laughs> no, <laughs> but like I said, it may be, but. What I have knew an uh, echinata to be is, yeah. Um, Christopher, Project X. Stylophora, yeah, that's a bright, super bright green. The bug out stylophora. I've got a nice. bug out like, style, man. That is a sick coral. Green base to it. With yeah. The, yeah. Um, Paul, uh, Great Bird of Reef. Ice fire echinata as well. That's a cool coral. Yeah, that one's cool. That's a touchy one. That's a it is. One. It is. It's, um, yeah find somebody that's got it anymore yeah i um i have a piece that um it's weird because it does well in one of my frag tanks and then in the display tank i put a little frag in it it's just it's just uh like been in this dormant stage you know it's just it doesn't right. want to grow i mean do you um what do you what do you try to do if you get a, like a, a frag that you plant in, in one of your tanks and it's just not doing anything maybe it's just encrusting and crusting and crusting or it just um doesn't seem to be active do you do anything to kind of try to spur things along yeah, move it in more flow. I mean, you can have those frags you put in there. You can have it in there for two years. Move it to a spot that has a nice pulsing flow. And in two months, the thing's grown three times as much as it's grown in two yeah. years. All of a sudden, new growth tips just start popping out. Yeah. I've done that many really? times. Man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, so I guess it helps to um, kind of have a system in place where you can kind of, um, if you've got a coral that's encrusting, be able to move it around. Do you have, like, some, like, special thing uh, you got set up where you can kind of, like, pop on a piece of, you know, crusting coral off of the rock work? Or uh, do you just uh, do your best to pull it off and get as much of the coral as you can? Well, if I got one that's encrusting across the rock, I like to take some dice and try to chip some of it off the rock. And get it on the top. Gotcha. So at least I get a colony growing that I can work with. And then, you know, a, a reef ages and you got encrusting corals in there. They start encrusting all over your live rocks. They can almost become a, or not almost, they can become a nuisance. I mean, I'll take a 
live rock out of the tank and chip off as much as with a pair of dikes, as much as the corals I can get off that I want. Take as many chips off the encrusting one and stick it on a tile, and I'll pressure spray that live rock off outside. Oh, wow. Yep. Pressure spray it off nice and clean. The encrusting coral, if it doesn't chip off, it's just a white, yeah. you know, and then stick that back in the tank and then plant some colonies back on it again. And there's been many a times that I've got to start taking the rocks out one by one, a little section at a time, pressure spray, it, put it back in. Yeah. Yeah. No, a pr a, a pressure um, a sprayer can come in handy for a lot of reasons, right? Great to clean uh, frag racks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, we got more comments about corals here, uh, Jason. Um, PC Rainbow is so nice in picks, always stands out, that's for sure. Um, Sam Hain, yep. is the Sundrop Chalice still on the favorite list? That's one of my favorite it? chalices. It is bright. The eyes are its super bright. I love that piece. Uh, Every time I grab one, I stare at it like, oh, man, <laughs> it's so bright. <laughs> Just a couple days ago, I did. Um, Reef Sea Forever. I have a Worldwide Corals Money Shot Chalice Sucker Stings Hurts. I uh, wear latex. Yeah, there you got them. Uh, May Fox. I love taking pics of the pink boobies chalice. It's a nice chalice. Um, Hollywood Chalice, I see. Uh, man. There's, t there's so many freaking corals to keep track of there, Jason. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> um... All right, dude. So, any? Um, I mean, what else uh, did we did we miss anything in terms of your methods and, and in terms of your se secret sauce? There, it, it sounds like it's a pretty simplistic approach. I keep it as simple as possible. <clears throat> you know, got to keep it simple. At least that's the way I do. Yeah. It. With so many systems, I mean, I've got probably thirty five hundred gallons. I don't know exactly what it is right now. It's a lot. Different tanks. I mean, if I don't keep, if if I'm not keeping it simple, it's 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 going to take a lot of different for me. It's going to take a lot of time. And <laughs> what? Um, I mean, so obviously you're uh, you're on the road a lot, right? What What's your yeah. day look like in terms of when you, with your tanks? How many hours a day are you like um, putting into maintaining those tanks? I've got a guy that works yep. with me. He works four days a yep. week. And uh, <laughs> doing a lot of the water changes, cleaning the glass, cleaning the skimmers. I'm doing a lot of the uh, fragging. A lot of fragging. <laughs> I mean, <I'm, laughs> a lot of fragging and cleaning, of course. Um, cleaning racks to get algae in one of the raceways. Got to scrub the frags with a toothbrush. Pressure spray the racks off. That one looks good. Then another one gets some algae or this. It's always, it's it's never ending. That's livestock. But I, I mean, that's pretty much every day. That's what I'm doing all day. Yeah. Working with the court one way or another, cleaning, fragging. It's whatever. always something, right? It's always something. Always. There's, it, it's, it's never like, not, you know, it's never always going perfectly. You know, you just can't, um, you know, set it on autopilot. I mean, that's one thing I've learned over the years. No, yeah, you can't. Um, Rob Upstate, New York. Thanks for the super chat, man. Really appreciate it. Great chat. Key is water changes, baby. That's the comment. That's uh, that is that is the big thing I'm taking away from this chat here, Jason. Is like water changes are a key to your success. They are. They are. They are. I mean, there's a lot of people that don't do them. I, I know that, but they work for me. <laughs> yeah. No, you got to stick with what works for sure. Exactly. All right, man. Well, listen, Jason, this has been uh, this has been an awesome chat. And um, so folks that want to uh, find you out on the uh, on the road, they just go to Jason Fox Signature, uh, signature uh, Corals dot com and they can see this, the show schedule on there. Yep, they can see the show, ske show schedule on there. Um, it's called it's the event schedule on the website. If you want to get my mailers for updates or any of that, you can log in to the into the website to get on the mailing list or anything like that we usually do a, a update once a week we did an update on the what you see is what you get section this evening yep. um 
So check it out. Come see me at a show. Do you um? Uh, I get out of the country, so I'm stop by to my booth and say hi. Yeah. Bro. No. Um. Do you so on, on your website? Would you say that you have um different things that you bring to the show versus what's on the website, or is it uh, are there things that um you know are the same in terms of what's on the website when you bring to the show? I guess the question is that I'm I'm asking you is that um. If you can't make it to a show, can you get what you typically bring to a show on the website? Typically, typically, but not always, you know, I mean, as far as the mother colonies from like the SPS section on the website, they're always there available, yeah. but all my corals are not on the website. There's stuff that I don't sell as much of. It grows slower. I don't have as much right. of it. Um, stuff I'll get ready for a big show like a reef of palooza or something i'm gonna get some special stuff ready for that yep. show and on the updates i'll just pull stuff out of my butt you know for update like look around 3500 gallons of reef and oh that's pretty that's nice that looks good definitely not everything's on the website all the time yeah. you know it's always yeah uh, maybe there's He's only released a couple frags a year just because it grows slower and I don't have much or I don't want to cut it. I like looking at it. You know? <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a great reason to leave it alone. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, so. folks, you heard it. Uh, you definitely uh, try to try to find Jason at a, uh, at a show because you could probably uh, find some uh, sweet stuff. You might, might not be able to find on the, uh, on the website. I'll, if I, if I make it to the uh, reef of Palooza in New York, I'm sure I'll see you there. I'll yeah. be there for sure. All right, it. man. Well, listen, Jason, this was uh, this was awesome. I know everybody out there, based on uh, the, the amount of people I've, I'm seeing in the stream and all the comments scrolling by, really appreciated having you on. And, and uh, yeah, check him out at Jason Fox, signaturecorals.com for the uh, show schedule and for some awesome uh, corals that you can buy from him also online. So uh, that'll do it for this show. Again, thanks uh, to Jason for uh, taking time to be with us. I also want to thank the sponsors, both uh, Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine, for sponsoring and supporting the show. I also want to thank all you folks out there that tuned in and participated via the uh, chat. Finally, a big thank you to Paul, who is the moderator, as well as the president of the Boston Reefer Society. Um, please, please join and support your local reefing clubs. They are so important to, uh, to this hobby of ours. And uh, I also want to let all you folks know that all episodes of Rapping with Reef Bum are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. My next Rapping with Reef Bum live stream will be next Thursday, February 9th at 7 p.m. My guest will be Evan Montgomery from Reef Builders. I've got Than from Tidal Gardens will, will be on the week after that. Adam from Battle, Battle Corals will be on in the near future. i got Julian Sprung and Charles Delby coming up. So uh, some nice uh, guests uh, upcoming. You can check out the full schedule of guests on reefbum.com under the YouTube section. Until next time, be safe and be well, and we will see you later. Thanks, guys.